about four different dimensions. And our aim with a framework is basically around what's the right thing to do. What's the right thing to do in ensuring that our hist the history of what we know is embodied in the concepts that we have? So that's the first thing. So for example, if uh, someone is reporting on teenage pregnancy, then one of the things that is important to understand for Māori, if 50% of Māori babies died 150 years ago, if Māori women's life expectancy in 1890 was 24, then you're not necessarily going to expect the median age of having babies in terms of history to be the same as the New Zealand median estimate at the moment of 31. So one has to think through the concept. If Marilyn Waring, for example, in our national accounts, wrote a book called Counting for Nothing, which was that we basically excluded things that we couldn't measure in the marketplace in terms of the activity that people produced. So in a way, our, our concepts have to represent what we, the best knowledge that we've actually got. And so what's the right thing to do? It's to make sure that we really understand ourselves, uh, ourselves well. The second is in methods. And of course, methods, the right thing to do, may not be the things that we can do. We ought to be challenged. We often, for example, privilege randomised statistical samples or random control trials, when in fact the best we've got is some darn good case studies. It doesn't tell us we know nothing. It tells us we have to think differently about the information. In practice, what can we really do? And sometimes we've uh, talked, for example, about um, response rates. The Maori Women's Welfare League response rates of 98% would actually be admired by any statistical organisation around the world. And the big issue is how to make that accepted. I remember, for example, 20 years ago, when we had the first Maori Users of Statistics conference that was chaired by um, Bishop Bennett, um, I went along thinking everyone would be excited by the new census results. Uh, and the one thing they would want to know is, how can we get more access to this exciting census? Um, and in fact, the, these, this huge mix of non-government organisation people said, actually, we get really good results from the people we survey, but no one in government will believe them. So what we want off you is to produce us a guide that they will value into how to carry out community surveys. And you won't believe it, that handbook is still on the web, and it's still probably one of the most useful things that Stats New Zealand actually did for Maori organisations was to say, here's a way of actually operating in practice that can be, can be trusted. The fourth thing about a framework is to recognise the setting that it is in. Uh, if I can, can, can um, quote um, Bishop Bennett, who made a, 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 a statement in 1973. Bishop Bennett said, or said in 1993, that it wouldn't therefore be entirely speculative to assume that most of the neglect of things Māori by those who developed the basis for our modern day New Zealand um, system and by his history was based on the earlier belief that Māori would ultimately disappear as an entity. Uh, and in many ways I think you, you might well say that public policy for Māori has very little historical anchoring in the way we've seen about a lot of policy with that thinking that it actually didn't really matter because Māori would be absorbed or and, and he makes the comment that the resurgence today is impacting on the nation in a way that the nation never dreamed of that would and is now suddenly faced with, with, the, the, with, with, with actually um, changing the way it operates. I can recall, for example, in 1996, where by, even by 1996, I know it would have been earlier if Tariana had been there, we never had any statistics on disability. And of course, one of the ways that you can change things with the state is by good rational reasoning, but the second is to do what the disability community said in 1995, is we'll boycott the census. Uh, and so we actually developed a survey and a census question with the disability community. We didn't have a boycotted census. We had an extremely good disability survey, which actually has still been conducted up to the last census. And actually, for Māori, of course, if you think about the rates of disability, the disproportionate amounts, even though it's not specifically a survey of Māori, 
but Māori are represented in it statistically, it's actually a, a very important measure. I can also tell you in 1918, I sat through a Labour Party caucus meeting where one Minister of Māori Affairs, Margaret Shields, tried to convince the boys in her cabinet to have a time year survey, but they thought that it was measuring women's work and they didn't want to know about it. I sat through, believe it or not, Mrs Shipley trying to convince the boys in her cabinet uh, to have a time year survey. And we actually had one at the end in 1997 because Anne Batten of New Zealand First, as part of the coalition agreement, I think they might have been scratching around for things to actually say to government that you needed to do, said, let's have a time year survey. And so we actually had a survey where we measured the unpaid activity of people in New Zealand for the first time. So I guess my point there is that the way the framework is about, is it's, there's a political dimension to frameworks in terms of what we see, what we actually um, can, can measure. I, uh, if one look goes back into our, our um, history, and I can see my lack of organisation of notes uh, is affecting me, but in 1891, the Census Commissioner of India, uh, Mr Barnes, had some remarkable names which I could never pronounce in English, but uh, they obviously picked them up at Eton, but he, he actually measured the whole population of the British Empire, as it was. And, and he noted that of the 419 million of the total population, 364 um, were of a different colour or race than him. And the categories he used, by the way, were white, mixed, brown, yellow, Malay, Polynesians, black and red. Uh, and by that, the cultural dimensions of the British Empire were generally set. Just as I have on my wall, social classification of 1990s of Englishmen. The bottom classification is the lowest class, vicious semi-criminal. Um, so not only was your income actually described, but your, the second was very poor, casual, chronic want, and the top end was well-to-do or wealthy. And I guess I make the point that in a way, statisticians, we should always remember, are captured by their times. There are very few, like Fetu, who actually try and change the times. Most of us are merely the creatures of our times, the politics, the thinking. And it's very, very much, that's why I think in understanding a classic, that, that frameworks, as I say, they've got these four dimensions, and they are about what I would say is what's the right thing to do. And the ownership of those different dimensions is actually not just the ownership of statisticians, it's the ownership of communities, it's the ownership of the people that are actually going to take some meaning out of the data. And therefore I, I think that statistics, in a way, is very, very much a public science. Uh, I know Florence Nightingale described it as the most important science in the world, uh, and some of us would think, but, but in many ways, w one of the big challenges for information, for frameworks, is to find ways of bridging the gap between the people that need the data and the people that produce it. And statisticians, I think, in the next decade, if we're going to really make the sort of changes in society that we need, and meet the challenges that you put to... Um, Joe Williams, of what are we going to do about rates of incarceration, what are we going to do about health, then statisticians themselves have to become much more richly embedded in the nature of the problems that their information is actually being used to repair. Well, anyway, thank you very much.